Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the University of the West of England, Bristol, and this latest Bristol Distinguished Address, which is a virtual event and will normally take place at our Faculty of Business and Law building here at the University of the West of England, Bristol, at our French A campus. My name is Mark Griffiths, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health and Applied Sciences here at the University of the West of England, Bristol. My professional background is as a proud diagnostic radiographer, and I have worked in the NHS and a, a variety of commercial sector organizations as well. The Faculty of Health and Applied Sciences is one of the four faculties here within the university and caters for approximately 10,000 students, over half of which are health and social care based. We have just opened a brand new eye clinic here at our Glenside campus for the final year of our new optometry program. Tonight's format is as follows. We will be hearing from team entrepreneurship student Maximilian Burrell, who is the CEO and founder of Biospan, followed by Dame Mary and Doug Perkins, who are the chairs and founders of Specsavers, whose talk this evening is titled Building the World's Largest High Street Optics and Audiology Brand. Once the talks are finished, we will be opening a short Q&A session for about 20 minutes, and we will aim to bring this session to an end by 7.30 p.m. As audience members, you can submit questions if you haven't done so already throughout this event using the Q&A box. All your questions may not be seen straight away, and we do have a moderation process in place. You can like a question if you want to, and also the questions will be presented to Dame Mary and Doug Perkins. This evening's event will be recorded and subject to um, no technical difficulties, it will be online within a few days. The online media library also provides podcasts from previous um, Bristol Distinguished Address lectures also. Please also get involved in Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag Bristol Lectures, all one word, where audience members can tweet comments and pictures and which will be followed during the event. So, without further ado, it's over to our first speaker this evening, Maximilian Burrell, who studied here at the University of the West of England, Bristol, on the Team Entrepreneurship Programme within the Faculty of Business and Law. And he is the CEO and founder of Biospan, which is the world's first biochefing service. Good to see you, Maximilian. Good to see you, Mark. Thank you very much. So here's my slides. So our ancestors were the greatest people who ever lived. I don't know why they made a Stonehenge, but they pioneered humanity and built everything that we have. Like when you're in a car, you just appreciate how it works, the ingenuity and mechanics, it's, it's incredible. Humans are the most intelligent species to ever walk this planet. Our ancestors touched every corner of the globe. And when that wasn't enough, we went to space. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And now it's our turn to build something that our next generations will take for granted. Today, we're living in the age of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmunity, things that didn't exist hundreds of years ago. And we have the highest rates of human disease in history. The NHS is crumbling under the weight of the chronic disease it was not made to handle. Like many people here, my family has suffered, my friends have suffered and so have I. But it doesn't have to be like this. Today, we know more than ever about superhuman health and more and more people are experiencing it. Have you ever seen Limitless? If you haven't seen it, watch it. Limitless is a fantastic film, but it's about a guy named Eddie. He's a, he's a loser, he, he's a failed author, his ex dumps him, but then he takes this pill, it's called NZT48. And when he takes it, he has superhuman intelligence. He writes a best-selling book overnight. He gets back with his hot ex. He rigs the stock market. He becomes what we all secretly want to be. What does super superhuman health mean? It means you are much more intelligent. It means you are never ill. It means you perform like a superhuman, whether that's sports or weightlifting or the bedroom. That reminds me, your sex drive is crazy. But you're also happier. You live longer. It's life 2.0. And your sexier as well. Your skin glows, your teeth whiten, and you build muscle and lose fat. 
Did you know you can be 20 and have the biological age of someone who's 30? The same way you can be 70 and have the biological age of someone who's 50. Our age on paper and our biological age are two different things. The word, I'll go back, the word lifespan scares a lot of people because they associate growing old with having the disabilities of aging and reduced life quality. But the longevity world is now looking at something called health span, which is how long you are healthy. You may recognize that slope uh, with slow age declining, but health span is squared off, which means you live life to the full and drop dead, but you're also younger, healthier, and happier the whole time. Jean Carment lived until 122, and she smoked until she was 117, but that's double the average lifespan of many places. And Usain Bolt ran 100 meters in 9.58 seconds, which was always thought impossible. Someone is already born who's going to blow Usain Bolt and Jean Carment out of the water. This is real, and we're living in an exciting time where it's possible, but the barrier to entry for even optimal health is it's too high. My name is Maximilian. I'm the founder of Biospan. I became completely obsessed with nutrition after taking medication all of my life, which ruined my health, and then I had to fix my health through food. I work with nutritional therapists who are some of the most undervalued people in our society. They help people recover from diseases which are often untreatable and give life back to people who've had it taken from them using an approach called functional medicine, which involves tests such as DNA and urine and blood. And then you get a personalized nutrition and lifestyle plan for optimal health. If there's something science and ancestral wisdom has taught us, it's that nutrition is the biggest predictor of your health span, your performance and the quality of your life. Superhuman health comes from high quality food and lifestyle, not medicine. And it's different for everyone. There's no one size fits all approach. When I started Biospan, I wanted to build the greatest health food company the world has ever seen without compromises. We wanted to make disease a thing of the past and superhuman health a thing of the future, a thing of now. Our mission is to make superhuman health accessible to everyone and it's tasty. We create meals personalized to your biology and deliver it to your door every morning so you don't have to cook. How does it work? First, you see our nutritional therapist who administers biomarker tests such as DNA, urine, blood, and and create a personalized nutrition and lifestyle plan just for you. Second, we design your meals every single week according to your nutrition plan and deliver it to your door every single morning. Uh, it's made by our uh, dietitians who design your menus and our chefs cook all of, all of your food. Our ingredients are organic. Our animals are grass-fed and our fish as well. These foods are nutritionally superior. We use glass packaging and collect oil packaging. We support regenerative agriculture because we love Mother Nature and we have to set an example for new businesses in this day and age. You can call it lifespan or health span, but we call it biospan. It's the world's first biochefing service. We're launching this London, uh, we're launching this February in London and we're raising investment now. My details are in the slide if you're interested in getting involved. Our ancestors were the greatest people who ever lived and now it's our turn to create something the next generations will take for granted, like Mary and Doug. Because of you two, my mum, my little sister, and my brother and I all have eyesight. So thank you. Back to Mark. Thank you, Maximilian. Thank you. That was excellent. Now we move on to our next speakers, Dame Mary and Doug Perkins, chairs and co-founders of Specsavers. I'd like to, if I may, share a brief biograph of Doug and Dame Mary Perkins and a little bit about Specsavers as well, um, as well, which is a worldwide brand. Doug is a renowned entrepreneur and a leading figure in optometry and audiology and is the co-founder of Specsavers and chairman of the Specsavers Senior Executive Committee. He's also responsible for the advancement of professional standards and supporting regulatory agendas across all markets. He's also a liveryman of the Worshipful Company of Spectacle Makers and has honorary fellowships from Cardiff and Swansea Universities and honorary doctorates from Anglia University and Plymouth University. He is a past member of the Institute of Directors Committee in Guernsey and a past member of the Government Strategic Forum in Guernsey also. Born in West Wales and a proud Welshman, 
Doug has maintained his Welsh connections. He was an in initial fund supporter for Tea Haven, which is a children's hospice in South Wales, and has personally in been involved in raising $70,000 for CNI's Dogs Australia and half a million for the Fred Hollows Foundation in Australia and New Zealand. Truly remarkable. Dame Mary Perkins is the co-founder of Specsavers alongside her husband, Doug, and is also a board member of the senior executive committee within Specsavers. A qualified and registered optometrist for more than 50 years, Dame Mary plays an active and passionate role in the businesses in many areas, including driving customer standards, championing values, and shaping corporate responsibilities. Well known for her philanthropy, Dame Mary is passionately involved in a number of charities and was made Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2007 for her services for char to charity and businesses in Guernsey. She's also won the Most Outstanding Woman in Business Award in, and in 2017 received the EY Lifetime Achievement Award. Truly remarkable. She is also a liveryman of the Worshipful Company of Spectacle Makers and a freeman of the City of London. Dame Mary places a huge value on putting people first and encourages all areas of the business to support their local community. And just a few words on Specsavers before I pass over to Dame Mary and Doug. Specsavers is not built on the stock, stock exchange model. It's built as a unique joint venture partnership where directors co-own and part own and manage their own stores. Theirs is a values led approach to business which has led to a worldwide organization that turns over 3 billion a year, operating in 10 countries and employing in excess of 30,000 colleagues. Doug and Dame Mary met in Cardiff while studying optometry together. After graduating, they bought Mary's father's shop in a hometown of Bristol, which they built into a successful chain of more than 20 stores across the Southwest. This provides invaluable experience when they set up Specsavers. With Mary being Bristol born and educated in, and Doug living in Bristol for 15 years and even playing for Bristol as a, a Bristol rugby club alongside Clonacli as well previously back in West Wales. They will now describe how their business experience in Bristol acted as an extended pilot for the birth of Specsavers and inspired their vision for affordable eye care and audiology at scale. Specsa support that Specsavers and the wider optometry community provided. UWE, the University of the West of England, during the design of our own very own optometry programme. And I would like to use this as an opportunity to say a special thanks to Mr. Paul Carroll, who works within Specsavers, for all the inspiration and vision he has helped us here within the university to develop our own very programme. So, Without further ado, I would now like to hand over to Dame Mary and Doug Perkins for their talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Now, I believe it's quite important with any company that everyone in that organisation knows its history, as well as the vision and the values that form the culture of that company. As you heard, Specsavers is a private family company. And tonight, uh, we'd like to share how that family background has helped shape the culture and the behaviours in the last 40 years of continuous growth. I believe every stage of our lives have contributed to our unique approach and to the success of Specsavers. It's, it's almost a story of two lives, of, of both of us. Doug and I came from working class backgrounds. Now, for all you Bristolians, I was born in Bristol, 22 St. Michael's Hill, and that's the house between the two pubs opposite St. Michael's Church. Uh, my grandmother's ran a, a boarding house at that time. After the war, my father left the Merchant Navy and he worked in a chemist shop. But with the advent of the national health system, and that meant free glasses for everyone, he went on a government scheme to become an ophthalmic optician, and that was in 1952. 
Doug's father was a policeman in Carmarthenshire with a family, a farming background on his maternal side. Now, the expectations at that time were for school leavers to either work on farms or to work in various steelworks. I have to say that both of us have the old fashioned, much aligned 11 plus exam to say thank you to, because that enabled us to go to a grammar school back in 1955. And we were able to do O levels and A levels. In my case, I went to Fairfield Grammar in Bristol. That used to be in Montpelier. Doug went to Clonetley Boys Grammar. So it was A levels for both of us and they were all science ones, with physics compulsory to go to study visual optics at the Welsh College of Advanced Technology, which is now part of the Cardiff University. And really, that's the start of everything in the year 1962. Now, I'm just going to speak to any females listening for a moment, because I want to tell you, it was extremely unusual for girls to do A-level sciences back in all those years ago. There were two of us in my year at school doing A-level science. And even when I got to Cardiff, there were only five females in my optics year. <laughs> How things have changed hugely. Just as we both qualified as ophthalmic opticians, try and spell that bit, ophthalmic opticians, they're now called optometrists, my father retired and my husband, Doug, bought his business. Yes. Doug paid my dad. <laughs> we both knew because of our upbringing that value for money was also going to be an important differentiator in our new business. And that new business was under our names, Bebbington and Perkins. Bebbington being my maiden name. Back in the 60s and 70s, optical businesses were not allowed to use generic names such as Specsavers you either had a registered company name or you used your own name. For us, business with its huge diversity of economy was the ideal city to start our journey. We, back then, we had two offices, one by the old Bristol Market in St Nicholas Street and one in Westbury on Trim. Both served many office people, technicians working on Concord, workers from the wheels, tobacco factories, and we did see a lot of elderly people in care homes. I was always brought up to treat others as you would wish to be treated and to be there for everyone, whoever they were. And I'm going to expand on that later. Now, neither of us, like a lot of university students, had any formal management skills or financial knowledge, organizational development uh, knowledge. So uh, we found in Bristol ideal venues for that, particularly Bristol Polytechnic, which of course later became the West of England University. It not only gave us a huge knowledge, but also it's a platform for all the studies that Specsavers now provides its graduates today. I can still remember the poly moving to the Cold Harbour Lane site in the 1970s. Now, this education and the experience of talking to similar peers, to ourselves ambitious people, opened the door to a new approach for us. And we were ambitious enough to move downstairs to shopping centres, high streets, and expanding the number of shops and even starting our own manufacturing. But after 14 years of working 12 hour days, we'd expanded 25 stores employing 250 people. At the time we were almost permanently in the 70s in recession. And we had uh, Harold Wilson, Ted Heath, Wilson again and Callahan, and they never came close to solving the industri industrial situation, particularly with the mining industry. And taxes rose eventually to around 83 pence in the pound. There wasn't much uh, to make a contribution to an onward business like ourselves. Now, probably the most memorable era I had from that time 
uh, for, for the wrong reasons possibly was Heath's three-day week when the miners' strike was on and we had to wire up all our equipment to batteries and uh, the lighting came, you know, fixed to generators. It was a very tough time. Fortunately, we weren't uh, at that stage with the maximum number of stores, so we did manage to get by. But by 1980, we felt we, we needed a more innovative business model for the future to sustain really a bigger scale, which we could see which was coming. Uh, and we felt that we needed a different model for the future. Now, Mary's family by now had moved to the Channel Islands, and this looked with our young family a good time for us to have a career break and uh, sell the partnership and relocate from Bristol. So going on with our little history lesson that we've been having, um, we could see Margaret Thatcher encouraging laws around the professions to change. That's what she wanted to do because she wanted more competition and she wanted some de degree of deregulation. What we were doing from the sidelines, we saw the likes of Woolworths and Debenhams opening up optical boutiques inside their stores. <laughs> well, that's certainly in the history books now, but anyway, moving on. It was proving an opportunity for new entrants, such as Boots, and the USA's number one company, Vision Express. Back then it was called Lenscrafters, by the way. Um, but it was obvious to us that the bigger retailers were going to control the whole supply chain and any value for money independence were going to become a thing of the past. What it did do is to present a golden opportunity to re-enter the optics world. But this time, what we were going to do, we were going to involve the professional opticians in the store. Both of us felt it was vital that we carried forward our original vision and values into our new optical venture. And we would state quite clearly what we were passionate about. We were passionate about our customers, our people, our partnership, our communities and our outcomes. Yes, we needed to build hundreds of businesses just like our Bristol pilot and integrate them into one brand to succeed. Now, we were very keen on having new owners. We, so we spent three years researching every partnership formula model from the USA and, and the UK and Europe. But we found that such a model of partnership as we wanted just did not exist. So we ended up writing our own. Now, at the time, the whole optical industry existed as a centrally controlled model in a kind of hierarchy where people in the stores had virtually no control. Even worse, there were no opticians believed it could be any different. And no one appeared to want to invest any money in our partnership. And we alone had to be the guarantor of the rents, the wages, in fact, the whole business. So we started a pilot for two years from Bristol, Bath and Plymouth. Then we were the guarantor to the next 20. And if any of those had failed, we would have been in difficulty. Fortunately, they didn't fail. <laughs> so we provided services such as training, product, marketing, financial and property on a fee structure. But partners knew that all the profits from their hard work was theirs to share with colleagues. And by the end of the 80s, partners and colleagues, they all believed by then that multi-site health operations were much better run day to day by local practitioner owners. So in the 90s, we were opening a store every single week. And by the end of the 90s, we'd started in the Netherlands, which in turn led to a complete coverage of Scandinavia. 
all being fortunately a great success. Now, in 2007, an opportunity, fantastic opportunity arose in Australia and New Zealand. This was a country which we were very passionate about. It had opticianry very similar to the UK, and there were 10,000 miles separation. There was a 11 hour gap, obviously, significant challenge. And significantly, the market leader was Luxottica, with 40% of the market, but also was the world's number one brand with tens of thousands of stores. Now, Mary and I decided that this project was so important, we spent all our time leading this opportunity over a four year period resident in Australia. By 2011, we were number one and still are in both Australia and New Zealand. Yes, we had a lot of air miles then, didn't we, Doug? <laughs> Going backwards and forwards. But by now, we were also established as number one in audiology, both working with the National Health Service and privately. That was in the UK. And a similar model has also been developed with the National Health System, working in ophthalmic surgery and eye health. So as the decades have moved on, we have even more faith that partnerships are the way to run complex multi-site businesses. So we have the partnership along with our vision and values, plus our people, and that has made Specsavers unique. Even our manufacturing is done on a partnership model, whether that be in the UK, Northern Europe or Australia. If we could recap on our values, where we're passionate about our people, where we support our teams to be the best that they can be. We put in a great amount of effort into training or learning and development, L&D as it's rightly called nowadays. This L&D covers everyone, including our joint venture partners and ourselves as well. It's keeping connected through learning that can be easily done online in the present COVID situation that has helped us. L&D also covers the hundreds of graduate optometrists as they study for their final professional exams. Right, so in 2012, I'd like to summarize now our history up to date. Uh, and uh, we were open now in 10 countries. It brings us to a position as number one market leader. We, have two, we had 2,100 stores and 37,000 colleagues working within the Specsavers umbrella. 3,000 partners, and uh, as I say, we've uh, achieved number one in all markets. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, we have 21.6 million frames dispensed. The contact lens is 530 million. Big challenge for the supply chain there. Hearing aids, 400,000. And uh, we recognized with COVID in 2020 that this progress was, you know, under significant threat. Uh, this was the, of course, the crisis in March. And we'd been through many crises before, and the 2008 financial crisis was a classic example. But then with our great communication with partners and great price promotions, we actually expanded our market share at that time. But in 2020, the whole emphasis on patient safety and being open for care has been paramount. That customer journey had to be monitored, had to be adjusted, and our short-term framework of uh, our planning is focused on now two years. And it was greatly helped by this daily communication and development of our hundreds of partners and senior management to actually give this consistent uh, performance. It was the joint venture structure at its very best. We're still aware of our five-year vision, but the total focus is on recovery. And 
meeting the needs of our customers. Quite right. Our ambition is to emerge stronger by 2022 so that we're ready for growth, more growth in 2023. All this can only happen due to that unique partnership that we have with the strong lines of the communication, which has become ever more important during COVID-19. I mean, every country we trade in have had their regular Teams meetings, along with stronger retail support 24-7 quite often, and with individual handholding support as well. It's not been easy. It's not been easy for our support teams, our partners and all colleagues in store, but we have been and are open for care. The strength of our recovery, I feel, has been with our people, our leaders and our partnership, where they care for their customers and they care for each other. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Difficult trading conditions will ease. Meanwhile, spec savers have remained available to customers who have needed us. What we say is that we all have green spec savers blood in us and have made a difference. And I have a saying to everyone I meet, are you mad today, M-A-D? Are you making a difference? So I ask all of you to make a difference. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Dame Mary and Doug. That was both inspirational and very passionate. And uh, thank you for sharing your personal journey, but also in terms of how you've uh, developed your business into a global success whilst retaining the values base that's so important in, in today's society. Thank you. We're now going to go to our questions uh, for Dame Mary and Doug. And we have the first question in already both. So um, I'm going to read it out to you if that's OK, the question. And unsurprisingly, just building on the last part of the, uh, the talk there, um, the first question is, how have spec savers responded to the pandemic? Yes, um, the second wave is not going to be like it is in March. Uh, we're so much prepared. We've got all our systems, all our customer journeys, our PPEs, the protection equipment that we use, absolutely performing perfectly. Um, our, our paramount interest is the well-being and health care of our colleagues and our patients that come in. And, you know, we are finding that the demand for our services is very, very high. Uh, and people want to keep on looking after their eye health. And that's important. Obviously, a major customer we have to bear in mind is the NHS. And, and our role with the NHS is to perform enhanced optometry services. So we do as many checks and, and supervision of eye health as possible uh, inside the high street so that any um, visits to the hospital can be as few as possible in these crisis times. We do domiciliary work and we do a lot of remote uh, eye exams as well. And there's a lot of ways we can help people without coming into the practice. So we're very much um, listening to our partners and uh, and basically working with them to provide the best system for this second wave uh, of performance. Yes, thank I, you. I, haven't got, I just add on to that. I'm going to be encouraging people to take some sort of a break next year. Um, everybody has just not had any holidays. I know we can't go away anywhere, but they do need to sort of step back from their businesses and and get that bit of a break yeah. and see four different walls because. It's, it does. It is worrying the uh, strain that it has on on people working seven days a week and longer hours as well. So um, that's what we're really be watching for in this second wave coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I have another question here, which is: You've changed the industry once. Can you do it again? Question. <laughs> well, you know, we we are working on this continuously, and probably the. COVID crisis when it's over 
will release all sorts of uh, opportunities. Now, whether they're, you know, influenced by the territory, um, you know, new territories to open, technology is altering the the basic models as it has done in in uh, most situations. So we are um, we have an innovation uh, department which looks at change in that way and where the opportunities are. Uh, I'd like to think that what we're doing in the medical field, um, we are very passionate, as you gather, from helping the NHS. We're very passionate. Uh, with the NHS, everything we seem to do is working in alignment with the uh, uh, with the NHS, uh, and no more so than with surgery, where elective surgery is likely to uh, uh, be diminished because of the COVID. So our surgeries, we're trying to open them up as quickly as we can. We're currently doing thousands of cataract surgeries and many other procedures uh, w w with uh, uh, surgeons as joint venture partners. So it is working. They love the system that we have, uh, and we hope that's going to be an innovative situation. But we, we are not about size for size's sake. We are about, as Mary says, making a difference and, and making sure that uh, the areas we advance into are ones that there is a significant need for our services in what we do. Mm, I agree. It's, it's looking to see what customers want, not what we think they want. And that's, uh, uh, you know, so we listen very carefully to what is happening out there, just generally, but certainly on technolo technological side, yes. A lot of, there's a lot going to be going on there. So watch this space, I think is the word. <laughs> so just following on from that question, then we have a question in from Gareth, um, who's li um, listening and watching this evening, talking about different environments and how you get into those spaces. What would you say was possibly the biggest challenge or opportunity for getting into the Scandinavian market as opposed to the um, UK or Ireland market? Well, of course, one would want to say language, but that's not true. They all speak very good English. And, and some of them have even been to UK universities. In fact, uh, I believe from Norway, it was very popular to go to Glasgow to do optics. So they've married Scottish girls. So when we go over there for meetings, we get the Scottish accent. So no, seriously, the, 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 it's very similar. We like markets where there's the university qualified optometrists as a partner, um, which you don't get in every country, but certainly in the Scandinavian countries, that is how it works. And we, and we like that system. Do you have anything yeah, to Yeah, yes. I mean, uh, I don't think um, we were hugely prepared for the international challenges. Uh, and we even thought that Specsavers wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be an appropriate brand, and we came up with all sorts of crazy brands, which none of them worked uh, in the same way as Specsavers work. So they all kind of understood Specsavers very very quickly. Um, so so really, um, I think it's the the type of people that are there. Um, and people that w want to work in partnership are prepared to change. That's what we are looking for and uh, and uh, making a difference. You know, we're back to that again. <laughs> so we have a question from, I think it's from one of our optometry students, actually, who was, who was, who was watching this evening. And um, they've quoted very inspirational. That's the first thing to say to you both. And I think that's great to hear from future generation of um, optometrists. They're asking, what bit of advice could you give for those starting out in their career as students um, in this day and age? Is this for um, optometry or is it in, in general as students? I think it's optometry, but also in terms of opportunity within optometry. I think the, I, I think the, um, the first thing to do is not to jump in and think, well, we can own our business and... Uh, uh, and and sort of create it as it goes along. You know, the 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 competition and the the framework of most industry now is very well established. You need to look for an employer who is going to help you on the journey. Uh, offer all sorts of uh, mentorship and training, uh, uh, and for you to be the best you can be. 
And I think that's um, terribly important. Uh, obviously, may, may be uh, even uh, in your early career work as a locum, maybe work, in fact, for more than one company so that you actually absorb the uh you know what your what life you're looking for in optometry uh and uh I, I believe that that is you know fairly good advice but you know just just uh, be positive about the opportunities i think it's quite a good time to come into the profession uh at this stage well certainly on the optometry side we see many hundreds of students doing their pre-registered year with Specsavers. So we have a very good program to make sure that they pass their exams, which is important to them <laughs> in that pre-registered and year. And, and many in, things, in my 50 you know, years, there's always been a shortage of optometrists. <laughs> yes. There's never been unemployment. They're always in demand because people are getting older and, and the uh, uh, amount of technology that provides better services is always emerging. So you'll never be out of work. <laughs> yeah. and, and of course, the advances on the medical side, it's very important. You, you want to keep an interest as you're, you're going on. Um, I'm going to whisper this. It can be quite boring just testing somebody for a pair of glasses day in, no, day out. No, no, no. <laughs> but with the, with, <laughs> we're, we're very strong on the medical side, so all the latest equipment, and, and that's how things move forward. Absolutely. And, and it, makes it, it makes life a lot more interesting. And there are good careers in hospitals as well, yeah. and uh, they're always short of optometrists. So, you know, it's, a, it's quite an interesting uh, career, always changing. Thank you. I'm sure our students feel very inspired by, by, by that sound advice. The next question yeah. leads on, actually, again, in terms of where do you see artificial intelligence impacting upon IK in the next 10 years? Well, uh, as a, I'm glad we've got this innovation department. <laughs> we, we are basically uh, developing that. You know, that's the advantage of working in 11 countries. There is one country uh, in, in the Southern Hemisphere that is uh, uh, very active in this area of making uh, predictable um, uh, uh, sort of analysis because we only see um, a client for three quarters of an hour you know, in their visit. So, you know, the more we can, more work we can do within the short time, uh, the better. And there are programs now from the scanning we do, we do what's called uh, CT scanning, OCT scanning, and, and that produces enormous information, which can uh, be um, going, more fields are, are working with the same systems as well. So things are going to change in the next, uh, uh, you know, 10, 20 years immensely. And uh, provide better services for patients, more reasons for coming into a practice for routine uh, scanning, because the chances with an older and older population of getting an eye condition is virtually 100%. You know, if you want to have sight when you're in your 90s, you have to look after your sight, you know, through your aging years. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's that prediction, early prediction with the equipment, all the technology that there is out now that makes that, you know, will, will be helpful. There's a lot of people after the, we have, you can imagine the storage we have in our IT systems for all these scans, and that's very valuable as well, very valuable. Yes, I mean, we can keep these scans and compare them. It all helps them with our diagnosis of conditions, which are, very difficult sometimes to di diagnose. Okay, so we have a bit of an alternative question here, which is uh, come in, which is, do you have a collection of the best jokes of should have gone to spec savers? Because everyone's seen those adverts. I have. <laughs> and, um, do you, and did you patent that phrase? Someone's asking oh. that very question. Yes, yeah. we, we have patented it. It may be not the what you know we've got such a high demand at the moment it may not be what people want to hear now but we the creative department is still looking at uh, jokes um 
Jack, uh, our yeah, can you, can you, partnership can you, colleague. Yeah. <laughs> can you remember the one with the elderly couple and, and the big dipper? And they got off and he said, what sort of cheese was in that sandwich? I'm still in, the gentleman in that, he's called Hugh. I won't give his surname out. I'm still in touch with him. Um, and he, he still gets, he gets glasses from us in, in London. Uh, so I'm, I'm still in touch with him. I'm, in fact, I've just written his Christmas card. Uh, he's in his, well in his 80s now, but. Uh, the sheepdog is the most popular. The, sheep, the sheepdog was very um, popular, yes. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you're, you're quite right that it has been patented and should have gone to spec savers, as are the green ellipses as well. That, um, you know, so that people do recognise that now on the high street as belonging to spec savers. So it has got a patent on it. But um, no, I, I love those adverts. But as Doug said, it's probably not applicable right at this time when we're, everybody is stressed and going through troubled times, which is, I'm sure you've seen some of the newer advertisements done, uh, created by us that uh, is bringing a smile to people's faces and making them feel a bit happier. So I think um, it's a time and place for everything. Yes. yes and like I said earlier, um, Dame Mary, it's about listening to the audience and timing, I think, isn't it, as well? So we have a question here, which is around how will the online sale of glasses uh, stack up against the bricks and mortar model which you've you know historically yes. built your business on yes i mean i i feel that that there is no substitute for a store experience and what we can do in that 45 minutes uh but there are all sorts of uh technologies uh emerging that um and we are we are uh, providing online services now everywhere to complement for those people who can't uh, come to the to the store. So um, it is it is work in progress for us. Uh, and uh, and as uh, newer technologies, we're trying to do as much uh, out of the practice as possible for the convenience to try and make the added value of coming into the store. But in terms of no store relationship. Um, we, we all we see at the moment for those people that have no relationship with the store is problems. Uh, uh, and therefore, we, we, we are hesitant in opening the market out where there is no store involvement. So I, I think it's a, a, a sort of uh, bricks and clicks. And that's the kind of future where both every, all the technologies work together. Uh, to create uh, a better experience, but you know that that's a challenging question that will be here for every year. But and it will change. And technology is such an important investment for us. There's nothing like a human being to talk to, <laughs> as we're finding out in this day and age when we're all on screen. Um, so um, I think we, you look at people that have been just purely internet. And even they start to open bricks and mortar. So they know that somewhere along the line, it's nice to have a human, even if you, I, I order things online, but it's still nice to be able to touch something or see somebody. So I think the two go hand in hand. Absolutely, I completely agree. We have a question here from Tom Fitzpatrick, who's asking about how do you, with so many stores uh, worldwide, how do, you, how do spec savers maintain quality standards and proficiency across all its stores um, that must be quite a model well that that's I think the principal uh, sort of reason why where we have the joint venture partnership I mean we we couldn't survive without it and uh, uh, because uh, you know in the Bristol original model uh, you know I didn't have that partnership and you know I would actually spend a whole afternoon uh, with a practice going through the sort of standards, but you know, by a few days, uh, the whole team had forgotten everything I'd said. So it was frustrating, and that's why I never wanted to be um, sort of doing my own sort of ownership, uh, sort of own hundreds and hundreds of practices, because you know there was no satisfaction in that because it was diminishing standards. But with uh, a team of two or three partners in each store who own the practice and and we invest the time to to connect with them they want to learn their commercial skills their their professional skills 
their standards of governance. They want to learn all that. And, you know, the average age of a partner is now 15 years inside the practice. And, you know, in many cases, they're better skilled than the support teams. And in fact, they become the support teams. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the way we do it through our joint venture partnership. Yes. I think it's fair to say that a lot of partners, we think and keep the standard, have worked in a spec saver store in whatever country it happens to be, and then they have the induction and become a partner. And there's quite a quite a lot of sort of learning in that, really. It's, as I said before, much earlier before, it's ongoing learning for everybody, even partners. Whatever, quite a few of them have done MBAs and things like that. So it's uh, um, it's a whole program. If should they wish to go that way. Um, and a lot of our support staff have this green spec savers blood. So we, we we keep in constant touch with all these stores, doesn't matter what country they're in. Um, so it's not like once a year rock up and say hi. It's almost daily that um, we're keeping in touch with everybody. And that's how the standards say the same. And the culture is very important that we have a, a sort of a family culture and a, a culture of caring. Yeah. So um but it's a good question. Every, everybody <laughs> asks. All good questions. Everybody, everybody <laughs> asks. A, a couple more, if that's okay. Um, got a question here <laughs> from Julian Wells, who's asking, "What's the biggest learning point or kind of learning curve that you've experienced in your careers to date, setting up and creating, you know, spec savers, optics, and audiology services?" What would you say to yourselves looking back over this career? I think the biggest learning well, for us was when we went into, it's when you dive into something you didn't know and possibly hadn't done your preparation fully uh, in every discipline. And I think when we went international, um, we, we basically uh, went because there was an opportunity there uh, uh, and we had achieved a certain amount of stability in one market, and then we decided, you know, that that was uh, it was a big jump, particularly on the resources, the quality of the support team, uh, and the IT side. Uh, in the, you know the areas we didn't fully understand, uh, the when you go international, you you have to have absolutely brilliant in uh, uh, sort of technology. So, but it's, it, I think that's the fun of it. You take the team uh, on all these learning experiences and some work perfectly straight away, but you know, you don't panic when you have uh, put yourself on the, the wrong side of learning and you just have to dig in uh, and, and master it. But uh, it's a lot of fun, you know, with the team. And, uh, you know, the, this COVID has been quite a learning experience and, uh, and we are, our governance is so good because of that learning experience. You know, going into surgery. I mean, what the uh, what the, uh, the the NHS do uh, and the way they run standards is extremely good. And and we've learned that. You know, so it's it's been a huge experience and and still is. Yep. I. I I have a comment here and a question. As a reason, this is from Jay Rice, who works at UE Bristol. As a recent customer of Specsavers, I can confirm that the level of service was excellent. How do you maintain the focus on value so consistently across all your stores? How do you do that? Well, we we have many layers of support teams. As as many, I mean, we we don't want to take the director's time with people coming into their stores and uh, and uh, having chats but you know the fact that you know the 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 teams has been a huge uh, learning experience because you know if we continually describe best practice and uh, getting their own peers possibly even their regions where they know them just telling them what's working well that kind of thing. So it's and and obviously we have regional conferences uh, online now, and we have national conferences. We're just going online. into our <laughs> conference season where we used to go to the international uh, center conference center in Birmingham, where we had two thousand people. 
We're doing it all this year online, but it will be the same kind of experience, the same kind of guest speakers. So it's a case of continuously keeping that culture of development and excitement in the whole partnership experience, really. And it's everybody knows what we stand for, the vision and the value. So that's everybody. And I think that's the important thing is that they they buy into that. So if, if they have a Specsavers partnership, that's part of it. Uh, they, they have to believe in, in the vision and the values and how it, the, that the customer is the centre of everything we do. I tell them over and over again that without a customer, a happy customer, we, we don't have a business. So, uh, you know, that, that person is the most, I tell them, that's the most important person in their lives. Uh, <laughs> not their husband or their wife or their children. It is the customer. And uh, uh, they, they laugh when I say it now because I say it so often. But it's very true. And, and that's what keeps the, the value there for the customer. Yeah. Absolutely. So we have some feedback here for the, uh, for the bosses. Um, here's from a partner. It says... As a partner of 21 years, I 100% endorse the Specsavers partnership and the potential that it can give to future partners. So there we go. I just thought you'd like to hear that as well. There's no name for this, unfortunately, but yes, but that's lovely <laughs> feedback. Um, it is. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is probably the kind of um, final question we have this evening, and it's from uh, Muir McDonald. And uh, inspiring and grounded talk thank you optics is highly regulated can you comment on coping with and perhaps help it to shape that in different countries how could you help some countries that are perhaps not as advanced as others in regulatory and um <laughs> policy well we we are the most regulated country uh, uh the uk in the world because the we over the years we've uh, we've come under the NHS through the General Optical Council. Uh, and so they have processes which sometimes we actually believe that we're, we're doctors. It's, it's coming down at us all the time. Um, so, you know, it's just something that has a positive side. But, you know, sometimes with innovation and change, it, it's sometimes a good thing to look at other countries uh, to see where things are going. So regulation and governance, you know, it's absolutely essential. But um, uh, uh, we have to be uh, able to manage that. I sat on the General Optical Council for 15 years, so I know how they work. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are good people inside the General Optical Council. And, uh, and uh, obviously they do a good job. And uh, it keeps the standards of optometry so that people trust it. It's been there since 1948. It's been uh, written in primary regulation. So, you know, you can't basically come in and just, uh, you know, do uh, an optical procedure. It's, it's, you know, without qualifications. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I understand from the question, would we go into a country where there was no regulations and what we would do? I think so. I, very difficult. I don't think we can, we can sort of go to a government of a country and say, look here, you know, you've got well, to do this. They've all had their different ways of doing it. I think it goes back to many years when um, an op ophthalmologist may have been the only person in that country doing the eye examinations and the eye check on health same with audiology um, and it stayed like that and then there were people who sold glasses so there was a difference there quite different to the UK I, I, I hesitate to say that I could go and alter that in uh, um, one or two countries which I won't name no but, uh, we, we won't <laughs> name them but we are already in one or two countries which have very limited regulations. And uh, I can tell you that the added value is in countries like the UK and Ireland and Australia, where regulation works for the positive good. Thank you. Thank you both. So we've just tipped past half past seven. Thank you very much, Dame Mary yeah. and Doug, for all the questions that you've answered there and for a truly inspiring and passionate talk about your business, Specsavers. Uh, thank you very much and thank you everyone watching at home this evening. Stay safe and it's just leads to me to say good night to everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>